Welcome to another episode of Stories from the Edge of Life. We once again have our very special guest, Dr. Stephen Radwani. Welcome back, sir. Hi. Good to be here. Thank you. So would you mind introducing yourself to our audience one more time? Uh, I'm Stephen Radwani. I am a uh, retired palliative medicine physician. I worked at Summa Health for 32 years and at Ohio State for four years before retiring. I'm married to a physician, also a general internist, and uh, two kids and four grandkids. That's me. And I currently still live in Akron. Great. And I'm Parag Bharadwaj, and I'm a hospice and palliative medicine physician as well. So uh, we had a great conversation with you last time. It was about, uh, you know, your your career and how you got into the into the field of hospice and palliative medicine. Uh, now we're going to talk about you. And uh, you actually brought up a great aspect to your journey in terms of how you got into medicine in the first place. So would you mind sharing that? Well, I uh, uh, grew up in an area, um, say a lower middle class area, um, I have a large extended family, uh, 50 first cousins. Uh, only one of them uh, graduated from college. He ended up going to dental school. I was the second. And then my brother uh, also graduated from college. Uh, and uh, uh, so I, I went off to school, not thinking about professional school at all. Uh, I just thought, well, uh, I seem to do well in school, so I should go to university. And I attended, I, I wrote well at the time, at least I thought I did, and uh, wanted to study journalism. And this was in the era of Watergate and such, so journalism had a certain romance to it, I guess. And uh, went to a small college, dropped out after a year, I just became disenchanted. And I couldn't really afford to go to school anymore. Um, didn't have the resources. So I went to work in several factories. Um, and uh, longest stint was at a, a rubber factory, building rubber hose for a year and a half, bathing in benzene every day during that period. So in that one year, I was a member of the UAW, the Teamsters, and the URW. Uh, went back to school just to attend, not knowing what I wanted to do. Uh, and I ended up graduating with a general studies degree and master's level hours for just a general studies degree. But along that path, I volunteered for a uh, public health program in Central America. An organization was non-denominational. Uh, we're partnering with ministries of public health in uh, Central and South America. So I was intrigued by it just because it would allow me to travel at not too much cost to me. And my first year I went to uh, doing that, my first summer I went to Nicaragua and gave immunizations uh, in uh, rural Nicaragua, you know, riding uh, uh, mule or horse, donkey uh, from hut to hut giving immunizations people would gather and would give shots, uh, keep the uh, vaccines on ice for a couple of days in order to, you know, do, run a circuit out in the uh, campo. And, uh, but my first day, you know, I, I was intrigued right up front by the training and thought maybe medicine is a path for me and then started doing this. But my very first place I went to immunize somebody was on the outskirts of this town we were staying at, at the end of the road. And it was a cardboard house, essentially. You know, a hut built out of pieces of cardboard, no taller than four feet. And I had to get down, in a sense, a little bit and crawl in to give the shots to the kids um, who were all malnourished. And the first shot I gave was, you know, supposed to be an IM injection to the deltoid and a 12-year-old using a... I think it was a three quarter inch fine needle and I hit bone 
and you know deltoid you shouldn't hit bone if you're going through the deltoid in a 12 or 13 year old and you know it it's like the light dawned on me and at that time i was just being a screw up in school and partying and getting decent grades and uh, uh, definitely working below my capacity. And that first house, it's like, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, almost a religious experience where I said, you are, you are a complete idiot, I'm saying to myself. You have all this given to you and you're not making the most of it. And uh, I went from there to go on to study medicine, but I never got even another B in college. I did all my pre-med in two years, uh, got into several medical schools, um, and got married. My wife attended, and I attended medical school together, but never got another B after that because I realized what I was taking for granted. Uh, and also I was seeing that I had an opportunity to help people at least in a basic way so then I went on I did that for three more summers uh, and eventually did a uh, started a uh, well construction project for communities using in the same organization Amigos de las Americas a well construction project for uh, small communities that had no water, uh, potable water. And uh, I did that over the course of two summers. Um, wrote a manual in Spanish even at the time with a lot of help. And, uh, and then, you know, went to medical school. My wife and I, we, we met in that program. Uh, and uh, uh, then you know, went on to medical school and internal medicine from there. But that's what got me into it. Uh, I was really a bit of a screw up until I did that and realized what I wanted to do and that I was wasting an opportunity. I mean, not everybody gets to process that kind of information and then change course, right? So uh, I think you have, uh, based on what we heard in your previous interview as well, you, you're a person who likes to help people and you found yourself in a position where you, you realized you were in a position that you were able to do that and you made the most of it. So quite intriguing because uh, last time we heard as to why you got into the field of hospice and palliative medicine and now we got to hear how you became a doctor in the first place and there's an underlying uh, common denominator there and that is wanting to help people uh, and provide service. So uh, well, let's that... be clear, though. You know, I took that. I volunteered for that for a free trip abroad, <laughs> and then only in the middle of it did I realize, you know, this is a good way to help people and to engage with people uh, and to do good. And I think that came along. And again, I had good role models, so I have to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're also being a bit modest because. Uh... You know, so many people do get exposed to those, those kind of experiences, but like you, you know, you mentioned you know, when the needle hit the the bone, that was sort of like the moment when you realize, hey, I could do something different with what I have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, let's uh, skip a few years. You you became a hospice and palliative medicine physician, and uh, you're practicing medicine prior to that. Uh, over the years, because you've had so much experience, what have you observed in terms of what really matters in life? Uh, how did your experiences in the field really change you and your your outlook on life and uh, you know people in general? Uh, if you could summarize that, that'll be that'll be great. Well, I, I I've I've always. Um... So you do have to find meaning in your work. And um, work feels less like work if it's meaningful. Um, and, uh, you know, there's even data that that prevents burnout as well. Um, and uh, 
I, I never felt burnout. I felt this, this work was such a privilege, especially given where I came from. Um, you know, given all the manual labor I did for a few years and the really crappy jobs I had, um, I have appreciated the opportunity to practice medicine, um, be compensated well, and to help others all at the same time. And to be able to learn every day is really a gift. I mean, it sounds corny. It sounds like I'm, I'm BSing you, but I've honestly felt that way my entire career. Really lucky. And um, I only retired because I got tired of driving back and forth between Akron and Columbus. And at age 68, my wife told me I was retiring. So, you know, when she says you're retiring, I'm retiring. You're a very wise person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but. And I'm still teaching and volunteering right. and stuff. So that helps. Uh, I'm still finding meaning in uh, lots of different volunteer and teaching activities. Great. Uh, because you have a lot of wisdom to share uh, with the well, maybe with the new generation of uh, doctors. <laughs> now, uh, was there anything in particular that struck you uh, during your uh, work in hospice and palliative medicine? Any particular experiences that you can share with the audience, or was it a, um, a collection of I, observations? I, I loved making home visits and engaging with people. Um, I also, um, it, it, there was always so much more to learn in, in people's homes. Uh, and as I, my administrative responsibilities increased over time, I had to give those up. But I always tried to find an excuse to do a home visit with, with a hospice nurse or a social worker or a chaplain jointly, and sometimes with all of them. Um, and the family present. Uh, but that was such a great learning experience for me, every one of those visits. Um, and I remember going into uh, so many different homes, so many unique things. I think in walking into a home, I'd always look for something to talk about and always look for the pictures and go to the pictures and have the patient or the family or both tell me about who's in the pictures and who they represent and what that means to them. And just get them as a means to get them to talk and to chill um, and to make it about them and not about me. Because uh, if we can get, you know, like in, as has been demonstrated, if you, if you get them talking more than you're talking, you're probably going to have a good, much better encounter. So, uh, always looking for for those things in the home. It's a lot easier in the home than in an office encounter or a hospital encounter. Um, but uh, you always have to look for those opportunities. Um, yeah. Me. So I, I think, I, I can't think of a, I wish I could, I should have thought a little more about a specific one. We'll have you uh, back. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but there's so many different home visits I just loved. Uh, just see the craziest way. The other thing you learn in a home is people cope with so much more than we think they can. You know, if you're seen in the office and you see you're sitting in the office, and I'm thinking more of my primary care mind, and I see this. Uh, older couple come in who could barely make it in the door, wonder how they got here, uh, hope they didn't drive to the office, hope they're not driving home, uh, and wondering how the hell are you getting by uh, on your own and thinking they need to get into a facility or something like that. And just, can't, you know, when you, when you get into people's home and you see how um, they've, often adapted it to their own needs and how much more comfortable they are than when you see them in an office or in a hospital. 
people can string along so much longer in the home setting than we think. Um, um, and even without a lot of support. Right. So, yeah, I, that, I think that was a, that was a one big lesson. Yeah. And I think from, from my perspective, it's just that I think, be, you know, when you make a home visit, patients, family members are going through a tough time, you know, given the yes. kind of medicine, yeah. medicine, but they're just so kind and generous. Yes. And if you acknowledge them when you go in the home, if you just say, you, you tell the truth, say you're doing an amazing job caring for your loved one. And uh, I, I'm really impressed. I don't know that I could do that. And if you can compliment them and acknowledge them and endorse them, as long as you're being honest, because people will read you if you're, if you're bullshitting them. But uh, as long as you're being honest, uh, uh, it, it means so much to people. That was another lesson I learned uh, early on. Uh, you know, make it personal and uh, acknowledge them and try to find a means for an emotional connection. Um, look for a way to identify with a patient. And that can be challenging when you have really difficult patients. But if you get them to tell, tell their story, and however you can, you know, using a piece of jewelry as a trigger or a piece of clothing or a picture. If you can get them to begin to tell their story, you might try to find that means to identify with them. And I think that allows for more effective emotional engagement. And uh, that's a hard thing to teach. And it's not talked about enough, I don't think. We tend to intellectualize that kind of thing as physicians and talk about going down checklists and this and that, whereas the, the fundamental basis for any successful, for a truly successful palliative care or hospice encounter is emotional engagement, I believe. And feeling, you know, at least, and, and, and at least beginning to identify with them a little bit. Uh, however difficult that might seem. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I think it's a good lesson for, you know, not just younger physicians, but lay people in general, you know, to consider that approach in, in interacting with people. So uh, you've had a lot of experience. You've uh, witnessed a lot of different things. Over the years, with patients, their families, personally as well, you've I'm sure we all evolve over time as individuals. What What do you think life is all about? I think it's just the connection with people. Um, in the end, uh, not that I'm off. I'm all for hedonistic pursuits, travel, good food, good wine, whatever. But uh, it's really ultimately it comes down to what's your engagement with people, uh, with your own family, with people you encounter, and can you help people? Uh, it's that um, that's where uh, there's true um, spiritual enlightenment. I think is in that connection, um, and and sometimes in that moment of connection. You know, I don't practice meditation or mindfulness or whatever, but I find in, in moments that connection has to provide a similar kind of peace and contentment. I remember an encounter I met with a very elderly patient uh, in the hospital as a consult, and she was quite frail and dying and was ready to make that transition to hospice. But I don't know, we just started talking and somehow uh, about poetry. And uh, we had recently engaged with the WIC Poetry Center at, at Kent State uh, to do facilitated writing with patients and staff. I don't know, we just started talking. And all of a sudden, this lady who I think mid to late 90s started reciting a poem from her childhood that she had learned, a long poem uh, 
and I wish I could remember which poem it was because I had to go look it up to see if she was really on you know spot on about it, uh, and she was, but it was from a a nineteenth century British author, British poet, and uh, not a short poem. Uh, it was like it was like eight stanzas. She recited verbatim to me. Uh, with this far off look in her eyes. Um, and she only lasted a few more days, I think. But in that moment, listening to her, I don't know what more I could have gotten from practicing meditation or mindfulness, but there was just a complete silence and sense of peace in that moment with her. And uh, the priv privilege it was to sit in there with her and listen to her. And to, uh, in a very, you know, we closed the door, it was quiet, nobody interrupted. For that, even if it was just two or three minutes, it seemed like an eternity. As she's reading that, and I'm, I mean, as she's reciting it, not reading it, reciting it from memory, and I'm listening to her. That is very powerful because, you know, a, uh... You're right. Sometimes you have these bursts of small moments, right? Mm -hmm. You mentioned two, three minutes, but but they feel like eternity and uh, they're very intense and powerful and very peaceful at the same time. Yeah. And I, in a sense, I came out feeling recharged and refreshed. Um, you know, after a longish encounter, I mean, the other stuff to get her to where she, Need to be. She required some discussion and help and and such, but uh, I felt recharged. And and I've had many encounters like that with patients, where it gets really personal, and there's just something between the patient and I, or sometimes it's a family member that uh, approaches, you know, the unknowable. I guess whatever it is, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because most individuals do you know who don't practice what we practice feel that we have a very tough and draining feel, which I I believe at times it can be, uh, but at yes. the same time, like you mentioned, it's a privilege, and yeah. sometimes these instances recharge you. Yeah, and 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 in the work, you know, to get make it through a day, you've got to. You got to pick and choose your, you know, you've got to often may have a long list of people to see. And in going through that, you have to stop and think who really needs your time the most that day and to parse, you know, maybe you know, a lot of these people get five minutes each because it's, you know, you know you're just checking in. Uh, uh, but then you see that one person who needs an hour or two um, or even three. And you know that's where you invest and engage, and sometimes that can be the one where you get you make that uh, kind of a, uh, emotional, uh, spiritual connection um, in a way. Well, I I, I couldn't have. Uh, I don't think we could have concluded this interview on a better note. I would like to uh, request the audience to think through. The wisdom that Dr. Advani has just shared, um, I can relate to it, um, and it's it's just amazing uh, some of the things that we are able to witness through our work in trying to help patients and their families. So, I'm sure you have a lot more stories to share, and I would love to have you back again. Um, Anytime, if that's if that's okay with you, I know you're. You're busy enjoying your retirement, but if you could spare some time for us, that would be most appreciated. Happy to. And it's really always a pleasure to speak with you, Barbara. Uh, Parag, I almost addressed you by your last name. I'm sorry. Parag. <laughs> That's okay. Well, thanks a lot. We'll have you back soon. Thank you. Take care.